Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin and this is Gospel Simplicity. And today we have a pretty heavy video on, on the books. It's about the conflict, uh, the, the war in Ukraine. And we're talking about Russian and Ukrainian history, specifically their religious history, and how that might help us make sense of or begin to wrap our heads around what is going on. I, I think that we all understand to some extent that, that events don't happen in a vacuum and that understanding the past can help us make sense of the present, not in a sense that excuses the present, not in a sense that makes the present inevitable, but hopefully helps us become better students of what is going on. Now, I'll be honest, this was a video I was nervous to make and I'm nervous to release. I don't often talk about current events on the channel and I couldn't be further from an expert in this topic. Now, I'm not an expert in most of the topics. I, I bring experts in to talk about them, but this is one where I, I'm really way in over my head. And so I'm joined today by Father John Strickland. He is an Orthodox priest who has his PhD in Russian history, specifically Russian religious history. He's written multiple books on the topic. And I thought it would be helpful to get an Orthodox priest and historian's perspective for this, because in the narratives that most of us are, are consuming, which I think kind of just reflects the, the modern way we think about the world, religion is given a very small part in, in the narrative. But I think it has important things to teach us, and I, I think history has important light to shed as well on what's going on. I bring this video with a heavy heart. I bring this with, with fear and trepidation, and, and I think Father John does as well, recognizing that, that we are so far from fully understanding what's going on. There is so much that only time will tell, and the danger of making a video like this is, is very present to me for, for many reasons. On the one hand, we all are grasping at straws to truly understand motivations and and the complex causations of things like this. But, but number two, in, in talking about history and talking about these things in the abstract, it can make us forget the very pressing reality that this is for so many people. I recognize that this channel has a global audience, which still blows my mind. And so I know that there are people that might watch this video in Ukraine, who have a very different perspective, or in Russia, who have a very different perspective. Not only a different intellectual perspective, but a real on-the-ground perspective, an experience of what's going on. And I don't want to, in any way for us to come at this as outside experts that can give all the answers, because neither of us have that posture towards this. And I just want to say to anyone that's been personally impacted, that, that's lost loved ones, that have had to flee their cities, that have had their worlds turned upside down. I, I grieve for you. Uh, and I, I lament that feeling of not being able to do more. And so I just want to say that, that this video is not made lightly. It's not made definitively as the end-all be-all. But it's an attempt to, to try to bring the, the blessing of running a channel like this, of being able to get information out and talk to experts to, to a wider audience and hopefully help us all try to make a bit more sense of what seems to be such senseless violence. And to, to echo where Father John will leave this video, um, I, I join him and I, I pray we all join together in praying for peace. And I think as Christians, that is our call. To, to pray for peace, to pursue peace, and, and, and to be a city on a hill. Um, yeah, th there won't be any ads in this video. Um, here, here is your uninterrupted video. Pray for th those affected, and pray that we all might usher in a, a future that looks a little more like the kingdom of God here on earth. Uh, even if we may never achieve that, may, may we never cease to pray for peace. Well, today I am joined by Father John Strickland. Father John grew up in Orange County, California, of Episcopalian background. Falling in love with Russian history while an undergraduate, he embarked on a career of historical study that resulted in earning a PhD and teaching at several colleges. While living in St. Petersburg, Russia, for his dissertation on church history, he began attending a local Orthodox parish and with time was received into the Orthodox Church there. While in Petersburg, he also met his future wife, Yelena. 
Together they now have five children. Father John is a parish priest at St. Elizabeth the New Martyr Orthodox Church and OCA Parish in Western Washington. Father John has also written several books, including The Making of Holy Russia, as well as what will be a four-volume series, three of which are completed, The Age of Paradise, The Age of Division, The Age of Utopia, Christendom from the Renaissance to the Russian Revolution, and the forthcoming fourth volume will be The Age of Nihilism, Christendom from Total Wars to Culture Wars. Father John, thank you so much for being here, being willing to talk about this very pressing topic of what's going on right now in Russia and Ukraine. Good to be with you again, Austin. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, it is my pleasure. I wish it was under different circumstances. And as we were saying in emails back and forth, we were hoping that in the time between when we had uh, talked about doing this and filming it, that this would all be over. And it's not. As we were filming today on what is Friday, March 11th, we are now a, a few weeks and nearly three weeks, I think, into the Russian-Ukrainian war. And for the past few weeks, the world has been spinning, trying to make sense of this conflict. And today we'll be looking at it through the lenses of Russian history and Russian Orthodoxy, as well as Ukrainian history and Ukrainian Orthodoxy. So to start off, because this is maybe not the most common path people are taking. There's a lots of narratives in the media about why this war has seemingly come out of nowhere and how we're to make sense of this. But why is it important that we look at history here, specifically uh, religious history uh, of Russia and Ukraine, to understand what's going on? Yeah, good question, Austin. I think that's a good place to start. I, the, the religious history of uh, Ukraine and Russia is fundamental in understanding what's going on there today. Uh, the history of uh, the 20th century and the rise of uh, uh, secular ideologies like uh, uh, communism and nationalism are also key. But um, the, the Ukrainians and the Russians, uh, to say nothing of the Belarusians, uh, they all share a common history together. And, uh, and that history is very close and it goes back a thousand years. And so that history was largely defined by Christianity. Um, it's not the only thing that influenced the history, but that certainly, I think almost any historian would agree, that was the key to understanding the common history. Uh, today we're talking about the Ukrainians and, and Russians specifically, those two Eastern Slavic peoples. Uh, that is the common bond or glue or, or uh, what fuses them together historically. And then in modern times, uh, with the decline, in part decline of, uh, of, uh, of, of Orthodox Christianity, traditional Christianity in those lands, the rise of secular ideologies um, and other things going on, um, that politics, that, has, uh, that bond has been um, greatly weakened. And uh, so I think that's where we start to understand it. Wonderful. I, I'm really excited to do this. And, you know, in my interviews, I range from topics where I feel like I know the answer to the questions I'm asking and I'm getting to kind of just share it with the audience to sitting on the edge of my seat really curious because I don't know and I'm ready to learn. And this interview really falls more on that side, Russian history, Russian religious history and Ukrainian uh, history and their religious history. It's just not something that I've learned a lot about, whether in you know my uh, kind of just grade school upbringing, it's not something that we cover much. And even in my theological education, this isn't really an area that gets talked about a lot. And it's not something that really comes up in our church history books, which tend to kind of move from Jerusalem to Rome and stick in Europe for a real long time before kind of coming to America at the end there. And so I, I'm really excited to learn. And so I think one place to start would just be uh, with, with Russian history, because this is, well, one, the area that you have the most expertise in, right? This is where you've done your, your PhD work in Russian history and also it's just very pertinent to what we're talking about here, because when we don't understand the past, it's often hard to understand the present. So if we could, maybe starting with the religious history of Russia, the, the conversion uh, of Rus or, uh, Russia there, and, and how um, that has marched forward. Yeah, and, and your point, Austin, about like waiting to learn, I'm waiting to learn too, uh, alongside you, because a lot of what's happening right now is very fresh. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, just today, Patriarch Kirill of the Moscow, the Moscow Patriarch issued a statement that, you know, adds a little bit more to our understanding of what he's thinking in all of this. Um, but still, we're still trying, waiting to figure this out. Historians know something about the past. They know much less about the present um, of what's going on, just because that's not history as such. But 
Um, and and as a an Orthodox Christian, I'm obviously very very closely uh, concerned with this. Not only as a Russian historian, but uh, as an Orthodox Christian, um, this is part of my church, and so um, I bring that to the conversation. But I want to just tell you and your audience to begin with, you know, as an I'm an American Orthodox Christian. I was raised in America. I've always identified with America, and uh, I belong to the Orthodox Church in America, which is an autocephalous church. Uh, that has close ties to Slavic Orthodoxy, but but does have her own kind of identity as an American jurisdiction of the Universal Orthodox Church over time and space. Um, I know that many people listening today will have strong feelings, convictions about the history that we'll be talking about. Um, if they come from a Russian point of view, that will influence how they see things very correctly, very appropriately. If they're Ukrainian, they will come from from that point of view and very correctly uh, interpret things that way. And I just beg your and your audience's forgiveness in advance, um, because not only am I somewhat ignorant about what's happening on the scene right now in the minds of, of the leaders and the people in, involved in this, but also, I know that I'm just one person, you know, and there's many points of view here, and I, I, I don't, I want to, you know, just acknowledge that, you know, at the beginning. So um, back to your opening uh, question there, uh, you'd like to maybe start by talking about the historical background to how Christianity came to roost to uh, to Russia. Did yeah. I understand your yeah, question? Yeah, I think that would be yeah. great. And I really appreciate yeah. those words at the beginning there as well. I think that's really important that we we, we approach this recognizing our own limitations and um, just that this is all happening in real time and also just the, the severity of what's going on. Um, and so I just really appreciate the, the posture that you're taking towards this. But yes, starting with, I think the conversion of Russia would be a helpful place to understand um, the, the beginnings of, of Russian religious history. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. And I know that today's um, topic really is about what's going on right now. And so if you ask an historian to start talking about history, uh, you got to watch out. So you're going to have to be the the uh, the the, uh, the referee here and, and call me if I get too far into the into the weeds of I don't think the weeds, the the uh, the flowers of history. Um, but but um, I think some of that needs to be said. So you call me back to the present if you feel like that, that needs to be done. But I would start the story, you know, um, I would start the story of Pentecost. Any, any history of any church starts at Pentecost, understanding um, what the church was from the beginning. But long after Pentecost, there were multiple jurisdictions of the Orthodox Church, as I understand it. Um, uh, a Roman Catholic would, would claim that that was a Roman Catholic Church, you know. So there's, a, there's an understanding for tradi traditional Christians that there is one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, part of the Nicene Creed of the fourth century, but clearly testified for me anyway in the scriptures, uh, one body and so forth. And um, as Paul talks about, so there are multiple jurisdictions. Um, this is foreseen in, in Acts chapter 15 when all the apostles come together to discuss at the Jerusalem Council there how to manage and administer the church, especially over a question at that point uh, concerning circumcision. And they all discuss this among themselves, and the Orthodox Church sees this as, as an early, an original uh, testament to what we call conciliarity, the, the principle that the Church is administered and ruled by her bishops in a conciliar or council-based way, where no single one dominates or rules over the others. And of course, most of your audience will know, of course, that after the 11th century, and, and maybe even a little bit before then, but, but certainly not emphatically until the 11th century, uh, there was a, uh, a papal model in the West that was introduced, that there's a Pope of Rome, and he is the visible kind of uh, uh, point of unity of the church administratively in one jurisdiction under his uh, headship. Even though a World Roman Catholic would, would hasten to say Christ is the head, the Pope of Rome was the present head of the, of the church so defined. The Orthodox Church never had that, and as a matter of fact, when the Great Schism of 1054 occurs, it has a lot to do with disagreements between East and West, between Rome and Constantinople, over this way of um, organizing and administering the church in her various jurisdictions. And so after 1054, um, the Roman Catholic Church went her way. The Orthodox Church continued in the East, uh, in the South at that point, a little bit still, not much because of the, uh, the Muslim invasions, but in the East continued to have a, um, a conciliar understanding of of church administration. 
So when the Russians convert to Christianity, they do so under Constantinople, the patriarchate known as the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. And the date usually used by historians, there's some disagreement here, but the date usually is 988, when the pagan ruler of Russia, his name was Vladimir in Russian, or Volodymyr in Ukrainian, modern Ukrainian. I'm going to call him Vladimir because that's historically, as an historian, that's just what I'm used to calling him. And I, again, apologize in advance. The, the terminology, the names, things like that will be Russian in my case, but that's not to suggest Ukrainian pronunciations are not equally legitimate. Vladimir converted in 988. His life was totally transformed by the gospel. Uh, he went from being a brutal, really bloodthirsty, violent um, ruler, um, uh, fighting civil wars against his, his rivals and so forth in, in what was called Rus. I'm going to call it Russia, even though technically the term Russia in English is a much later word, divining an empire rather than something that's more ethnically homogeneous. When he became ruler of Rus, he was very violent, but he converted and the gospel really transformed Vladimir's life. This is an amazing thing. And I encourage your audience to learn more about Vladimir. He's one of those rare exceptions, not only in church history, but including Russian history, where the ruler is really, really transformed by Christianity. Um, he, uh, he, he, he really changed his life. He, he dismissed all of his concubines. He married a Byzantine Orthodox princess. Anna was her name. Uh, was faithful to her until her death. Um, he he uh, introduced uh, 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 policies of uh, bread distribution and charity in Kiev, where he ruled from. That was the center of his realm. Um, he even tried to abolish capital punishment, which is mind blowing in the in the in the in the tenth uh, century. But because of the gospel and it's it's the Sermon on the Mount and loving our enemies and forgiveness and all those things. The ruler of, of Russia at that time, Vladimir, even considered abolishing capital punishment. So he left behind a legacy of a, co uh, of a political culture that was really in influenced by Christianity. But at the same time, he also inherited Christianity from Byzantium, from Constantinople, which was at that time the greatest and mo the most flourishing, richest um, empire in, in Christendom. And... Um, and that will have a big impact historically on how the Orthodox Church in Russia develops. About 50 years after Vladimir's conversion, um, we have that great schism I've mentioned already, where uh, Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy are now seen as distinct. That takes centuries to work out. I don't want to suggest that it's just like one break and then it's over. But, but really, with time, the uh, Russian uh, Christians, Orthodox Christians, looked on Roman Catholicism really as um, as another church, not their church. They identified with Byzantium. Um, when the uh, sack of Constantinople occurred under Roman Catholic armies in 1204, the Russians identified with that, you know, identified with the Orthodox in that case. More importantly, coming forward into the Muscovite um, period of Russian history, in the 15th century, um, there was an effort as Constantinople was about to fall to the Turks, the Muslim Turks, and finally did in, in 1453. About that time, there was a, a reunion council um, sponsored by the Pope of Rome um, called the Council of Florence. And that council brought a lot of Orthodox bishops to Italy, where they signed on to a union, a reunion of the church agreement, uh, something that had failed to arise from the sack of Constantinople in 1204. But this reunion council fell apart itself when those bishops came back and they, it was rejected by the people of the church. Um, in the case of Russia, the um, Metropolitan of Russia uh, participated in that council. When he came back, having been uh, signed, signed on to the reunion, he was thrown out of Moscow and finally left because they were so hostile toward the idea that um, that, that reunion would happen on Roman Catholic terms. The terms of the council really required the Orthodox to become Roman Catholics. Um, so Russia developed, especially in this, this period when Kiev no longer is the center, but um, Moscow becomes the center further east, develops a strong sense that she is not the West, if the West is defined as the Roman Catholic Church primarily, as it was at this, at this time until the Reformation anyway. And, um, and, and further dividing Russia from the West was the Mongol invasions, which occurred in the 13th century. 
they very significantly for our topic today severed Kiev and what we would call modern Ukraine from uh, the rest of the um, Russian Orthodox uh, population further east. And those Western uh, Russian territories or Ukrainian territories, they weren't called that at the time, but we could call them that, they became ruled by, um, by Poland largely under Roman Catholic influence. This gave rise, for instance, to the, the conversion of many Orthodox to uh, Roman Catholicism in the form of uh, what's today called Byzantine um, Catholicism uh, or uh, Uniatism uh, from the Union of Brest-Litovsk, where uh, in the late uh, 16th century, um, many Orthodox uh, bishops led their flock to commemorate the Pope of Rome, provided they could continue to serve the Divine Liturgy as they historically had with married priests. So this um, really alienates the further Eastern Orthodox population, especially of Moscow, which by the um, 17th century now, um, having developed a strong autocracy, a very powerful centralized state, in part to fight threats like the Mongols from the East, but also the, the Poles um, invaded Russia in, in the, uh, the early 17th century. There's a war by Poland against Russia and Roman Catholicism, they try to put Roman Catholicism on the throne in, in, in the Kremlin in Moscow. This again just really alienates the Russian Orthodox population from the West. And so you get by the end of the Muscovite period, you get this really strong national identity centered upon Moscow that the Orthodox Church of Russia is not the West. And not even uh, of, of, of Byzantium, which was now long gone, and, and many even developed an attitude that Byzantium was long gone in part because she signed on to that Council of Florence and kind of gave up um, the, the faith, as it were, submitted to um, the Roman Catholic Church. And so this really gets a kind of a complex kind of series of, of convictions about, about things. But that really um, begins to change significantly in the time of Peter the Great. So by the end of the 17th century, a radical transformation occurs in statecraft in Russia, where um, the Byzantine model that Moscow had been following up until that time, um, and the Kievan model before that, um, that those are no longer followed. It's now Westernization and the, the modern nation state or empire with its secular um, culture and its uh, bureau, bureau, bureaucratic form of government, uh, great power politics, strong militaries, using modern technology to be, make Russia a permanent part of any war in Europe. And from Peter forward, Russia has always been a necessary, Im important part of resolving military conflict in the, in the history of Europe um, to the present day with the NATO-Russian kind of divide that exists. So Peter the Great you know, has a secularizing I I influence or impact on Russian civilization he, and, and this reduces the influence of the Orthodox Church, which until his time <clears throat> had been absolutely central. In the time of Vladimir of Kiev from the beginning, very, very important in the political culture and piety, monasticism and so on. In Moscow, very important in the state sense of its identity against a West, against a, you know, a hostile East like the Mongols. <clears throat> and so with Peter now, the West becomes the model. And, and there's a real effort to westernize Russia under, under uh, Peter and his followers, people like Catherine the Great. It's at this time also, about this time, even before Peter, that, that Ukrainian, those Ukrainian lands, Kiev and so forth, are, are integrated into um, the Russian state, the Russian empire, as it's now called. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Poland, Roman Catholic Poland, had 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 assimilated those territories back after the Mongols kind of broke up the Kievan state. <clears throat> and so now Russia conquers from Poland and other Western powers um, a lot of those Ukrainian lands that today are part of what we call modern Ukraine. And so those get reintegrated now into, or integrated, uh, depending on how you see it, into a Muscovite model of church life, where there's a Mos there was a Moscow patriarch uh, up until Peter, uh, he abolishes significantly the Patriarchate of Moscow, leaving Russia to be ruled by bishops that are appointed largely under state influence, which is very, very problematic. It really, really um, 
just it just uh, really disintegrates the spiritual strength of the Russian church. And the Ukraine now is now joined to that larger Eastern Slavic civilization we call the Russian Empire, along with Belarus. So that's how things were throughout the 19th century, um, when it was clear that there were big problems by adopting westernization wholeheartedly that brought not only secularization from the Orthodox Church's point of view, but it also meant submit, subjecting the church to state control and power. Now, that Byzantine model I mentioned earlier is very important uh, for understanding this. Byzantium had developed um, a very close relationship between the emperor, the ruler of the state, and the bishops, especially the chief bishops, like the Patriarch of Constantinople. Very close relationship. This relationship was called symphony. And it's sometimes discussed in newspaper articles and online articles that you read today about the relationship of Putin and uh, Patriarch Kirill. And we will want to talk a little bit about that in light of this historical detail. That had always been a big part of the uh, of, of Russia's um, the Russian Orthodox Church's relationship to the state. But Peter's um, really suppression of the independence of the church uh, the abolition of the patriarch, for instance, patriarchate, um, this created a lot of problems that awaited resolution only when that state was overthrown, which occurred in 1917 with the Russian Revolution. And so at the, in the beginning of the 20th century, about 100 years ago, um, things got turned upside down in Russia um, by the revolution. At first, there was a disintegration of the Russian Empire, as the Bolsheviks came to power, they reestablished the reunion of the Russian Empire in the form known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, or simply Soviet Union. And their armies, the Red Army, conquered a lot of territories that had broken free under the influence of nationalism. Now, um, nationalism is a big, powerful force as a secular ideology in the early 20th century. World War I resulted from nationalism. And this all takes place, of course, during and after World War I. So a lot of the territories of the Russian Empire are under the influence, not so much of traditional Christianity, but now under secular ideology, namely nationalism or uh, socialism in the form of communism. To come to the Ukraine in the 20th century, there, during the revolution, there's a nationalist movement in the Ukraine to break free of the Russian Empire. Many Ukrainian nationalists um, were inspired by writings of the 19th century. Ukrainian nationalism hasn't always been there. It was, like all nationalisms really in modern times, an invention of the 19th century to give meaning to and purpose to and power to uh, different political entities, including Russia, because the Russian state, Russian empire was nationalistic too. But in Ukraine, there were like early um, examples of Ukrainian national identity. Mykola Kostomarov was a famous historian of the 19th century that kind of laid out a way of thinking about what might be called uh, Western Russia, the Western Russian Empire, as a, U a separate nation called Ukrainians. The word Ukrainian actually comes from the word for borderland in Russian because it was simply the Western borderland of, of the Russian Empire. But now it becomes understood as a separate nation and because of the chaos and oppression, not only of the Russian Empire, but of the communist system as it's starting to form itself, a lot of Russian nationalists arise and try to lead Russia, I'm sorry, not Russian, Ukrainian, away from the Soviet Union. So for a brief time, you, there's a Ukrainian nationalist movement, and that nationalist movement, which is finally suppressed by the Red Army, and Ukraine is reintegrated into the Soviet Empire, Soviet Union, um, that nationalist movement stirred up and really supported a independent Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. One example of the um, of the suffering and the death that resulted from this uh, nationalism was the the martyrdom of the first bishop of the Orthodox Church in in uh, in the Soviet Union. And that was Vladimir of Kiev. He was the Metropolitan of Kiev, and he was beaten up by um, Ukrainian communists and, who were also nationalists. It kind of blended together in their case. They took him into the monastery there uh, in the Kievan caves. They beat him terribly um, and they dragged him out and they shot him to death. Um, it's really a beautiful end to his life though. It was said that he was blessing them with the sign of the cross as, as they shot him. 
um, to death. He was the first bishop of the of the Orthodox Church to be martyred in what became known as the New Martyrdom. Um, so you can see there's a real uh, there are real consequences, d destructive consequences, violent consequences um, to to nationalism. Um, but be that as it may, this Ukrainian effort to create a separate Ukrainian Orthodox Church, it really floundered. At first, it, it, it existed for about a decade in the 20s under a self-proclaimed um, autocephalous Orthodox Church, um, the leaders of which, um, one was named Vasil, uh, could, not find, could not find a bishop to bless the formation of their autocephalous church. Autocephalous is a technical term in orthodoxy, meaning one of those local regional uh, jurisdictions I mentioned earlier in that conciliar model of rule. And, and so with time, Russia had become autocephalous from Constantinople and now was claimed by some many Ukrainians that Ukraine should become autocephalous from Russia. Um, and so they couldn't find a bishop to bless this. And so they be they they gathered priests and people together to bless uh, uh, ordination of a bishop, which is non-canonical and and was rejected by the larger Orthodox Church throughout the world. But they nevertheless claimed their existence. Some of them fled to America and continued to exist in the United States where religious freedom existed. Uh, after the Soviet Union suppressed this autocephalous Orthodox Church of the 1920s. And so the Soviet Union's history went forward, and, uh, and finally, toward the end of that history, it collapsed. The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 at a moment when nationalism was again breaking up, breaking out, and offering a secular model of how to reorganize political, cultural life in the world. Um, and, and part of that was uh, the the Declaration of Independence of, of Ukraine in, in in at this time, and by 1992 there's a separate independent Ukraine, and again the rise of a claim that the Ukrainians as a separate nation distinct from Russia should no longer be under the Patriarch of Moscow, uh, which has by, by the way been restored under Soviet during Soviet times, um, been restored, and they should in fact have their own autocephalous Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So I'm sorry, again, I apologize before, but I wanted to give some sort of background history. There's a lot in that history that I didn't spend much time with that we might want to return to points uh, along the way uh, that will help us understand where we are today uh, with the conflict between uh, Orthodox in Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, and that was great. Thank you so much, Father John. I think, I think there is a couple points that I'd love to kind of get back to there. And one of them was, what I seem to be picking up is that from a very early time, around the time of the Mongol invasion, when you have uh, Ukraine, and to use maybe slightly anachronistic terms, but there's this uh, sense of Ukraine being in the West at that time, right? So after that mm -hmm. invasion, mainly uh, ruled by Poland, and you have uh, Roman Catholicism coming in, it seems like even at that point, there's this sense from Russia that, that we are the East moved away from the West, and, and this has deep religious overtones, not just West in terms of geography, but West in terms of Roman Catholicism, and that Ukraine was somehow going in that direction, which would have been troubling for Russia. Not to you know, say that maps one-to-one -one onto what's happening now, but is that a fair connection that I'm seeing there? I, I think so. At one, at one level, in one way, um, it would have been seen by everyone, including the um, People of the West, the Western. We should we should use some other terms here to help kind of fill things in. There, the Russians, the Ukrainians, and the Belarusians are all belong to a language family called the East Slavs or Eastern Slavs. They all have very close connections linguistically to each other. They're distinct from Western Slavs like the Poles or the Czechs or the Slovaks, and from Southern Slavs like the Serbians and Croats, Slovenians. And so um, Bulgarians. And so the Eastern Slavs were a family today, really three main families uh, or three groups within that family. Um, and and so your question is, was it seen as a problem to Russians that the Ukrainians became affiliated with or ruled by the Poles? They didn't think of it that way at that time. They didn't think, oh, there's the Ukrainians that are ruled by the Poles and we Russians are ruled by Moscow. They thought of themselves as really still the, the, the Slavs, the the Rus, and that term is sometimes helpful to distinguish. Rus refers to all three uh, members of that linguistic family, Rus, that were ruled uh, by Vladimir and his successors. 
Um, so in the West, yeah, there was a lot of Western influence. I mentioned that Union Treaty that brought a lot of Orthodox under Rome, uh, the Uniate uh, Church under Rome. That was the most uh, blatant example of how Russians back further east in, in Moscow would have seen the problems of, of the fact that those Orthodox are living under Western um, kind of patronage or influence. And they, they, I think to anticipate your, you know, kind of to see another question by the one you asked, and that is, I think a lot of them would have said, it, the sooner we get those people integrated back into a Orthodox church with her own, you know, autocephaly and with her own political state, Moscow, Muscovite Russia, to rule her, the better, because that's going to protect them from being picked off by Western Christians. Interesting. Yeah. And that is a helpful anticipation there. So uh, maybe to, to zoom forward a bit here, you talked at the end there about uh, nationalist movements, both in, in Ukraine and Russia, uh, but, but specifically in Ukraine there a bit more, um, it, at least in terms of time given talking to it, not saying it was more nationalistic there. Um, and there was movements to have an autocephalous church in the Ukraine, um, which struggled to find a bishop to bless it um, back in was it the 20s, and then um, mm -hmm. pops up again after Ukrainian independence. For people that are curious about kind of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine today, what, what does that landscape look like? I know just down the street from me in Chicago, there's Ukrainian, uh, let's see, Ukrainian Eastern Catholic churches. So I imagine that's a thing in the Ukraine as well, that that legacy of um, what, whether you want to call them Byzantine Catholics, Eastern Catholics, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. units, whatever you want to use there, still seems to exist today. But there's also mm -hmm. the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. And there's actually two types. Is there an autocephalous church there and one that reports elsewhere? I'll allow you to... Yeah, that. so let's just jump forward now to the present, <clears throat> now that we've got the historical uh, survey behind us. Um, but I, I, I can't emphasize enough, I'm just, not just as an historian, but really as someone who watches the news accounts about what's going on today in Ukraine, I have to say, and, and, and maybe there'll be a little bit of opinion coming through here, so I apologize for that, but I have to say, no matter on what side one's getting their news, right or left, it could be Fox News on the right, it could be CNN on the left, I've tried to kind of take a look at both of those and other sources, um, it seems like it's really just one perspective. And that perspective is almost totally ahistorical. Uh, I mean, almost no one's talking about the deeper historical reasons behind all of this. They're not even looking at the recent history. I'm, by recent, I mean past 50 years with NATO and the real history of, of why NATO expansion caused a lot of Russians to be really, really unhappy and really, really um, uncomfortable and even begin to panic. I think maybe that's Putin's invasion was a act of panicking. Um, but be that as it may, today in Ukraine, um, we need to, under, to understand what's going on in Ukraine. We need this historical background. So the more recent developments that you referred to include the formation of now a partially recognized autocephalous Orthodox Church of the Ukraine. That church is um, was 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 formed from that earlier non-recognized autocephalous church that emerged in the 20s. Um, some of its membership um, emigrated to America and stayed in America as a, with a presence um, throughout the recent the uh, the the, uh, the the history that's occurred since then. And, and, and under, partly under that influence, this new church was uh, created in, in, in 2018 with the blessing of Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople, or Istanbul, the ecumenical patriarch. Now the, uh, and that created, as you just said, two separate Ukrainian Orthodox churches in the Ukraine, in Ukraine. Um, and if you'd like, I'll just quickly describe a little bit of the background to that development. Uh, in 1992-ish, um, with the independence of Ukraine from Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the majority of Orthodox Christians in Ukraine continued to belong to the Moscow Patriarchate, as they had during Soviet times, 
and all the way back to you know the 17th century when most of Ukraine was integrated into the Muscovite state they had for centuries. Um, but since, of course, the Moscow Patriarch was seen as a symbol of Russian national you know, identity and Ukrainians wanted to establish their own sense of national identity, there were a lot of people who claimed we should create that autocephalous church or recreate the one that was abortively created in the 20s. And so what the leader of this whole point of view was someone named Filaret. Uh, Filaret was a metropolitan of, 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 of Kiev. And he broke from, at first tried to get the, the Moscow Patriarchate to grant autocephaly, and when it wouldn't, um, he broke from it and created his own auto, so-called autocephalous church. So now you have, at that point, you have three uh, specific Ukrainian Orthodox churches. You've got the Moscow Patriarchate, which is, is really the historical um, kind of majority, then you've got the Ukrainian autocephalous church that was created in the 20s, but never really took off and has very small influence. And now you've got this new nationalistically defined one uh, of Filaret of Kiev. Well, Filaret is actually um, uh, deposed and excommunicated. He's, he's actually anathematized for, for simply breaking on, an, on his own, creating his own jurisdiction. So he had a very low reputation among all Orthodox throughout the world. This is just not how church governance is supposed to happen. You don't just create your own church, <laughs> you know. And so, um, so he was, you know, he was he was not very um, highly regarded in Orthodox churches throughout the world, nor were the Ukrainian autocephalous church. But now Bartholomew, Ecumenical Patriarch in 2018, decides to step in and create a, a, an autocephalous Orthodox church in Ukraine against the will. Um, and in direct ha- kind of resistance to the policies of Mo- the Moscow Patriarchate, which, by the way, today is under Kirill, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. Now, the reasoning by- behind Bartholomew that was released, we can, um, other people have, you know, I think responsibly and reasonably uh, considered other causes and influences that were going on there, but let's stick to what uh, Bartholomew himself said he was doing. He was recognizing the fact that after 30 years of independence, a very large Orthodox community, namely the Ukrainians, uh, the Ukraine has 44 million people in it, so it's it's the second largest uh, Orthodox church after Russia, the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, uh, Bartholomew said it's time for this church to have her own autocephalous life, and we're going. We as the as the Ecumenical Patriarch, the first uh, in 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 kind of uh, primacy or or level of um, kind of honor in the list of all those regional conciliar Orthodox churches that I talked about earlier, have the right <clears throat> and the duty to grant this to them. Uh, he claimed this um, as a right in part because back in the 17th century, um, Kiev actually had been ruled from Constantinople. Um, after the after the fall of Kiev to the Mongols back in the 13th century, that's one of the reasons I talked about that history, um, Kiev uh, finds her way back to Constantinople, and she's not ruled from Russia directly uh, when Russia becomes has her own uh, metropolitan and later patriarch. Kiev is for a time ruled by Constantinople without much effect. Constantinople was under the Turks, very weak, and there wasn't much of a connection there. So. Uh, finally, in the 17th century, the Ecumenical Patriarch grants um, jurisdiction of Kiev and the Ukraine, we'd call it today, to Moscow in the 17th century, the 1600s, where it was r- ruled or administered to the, to the 20th century, to the 21st century, really. And now he claims, the Patriarch of uh, Constantinople, Bartholomew, claims he has the right, because of this precedent, to step back in and revoke Moscow's um, jurisdiction in Ukraine and reassign it to an autocephalous Ukrainian church that he, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, has now created. And so he does it in 2018, just a few years ago. I'm sure your audience was aware of this going on. Some of them may have studied this very closely. Um, in 2018, uh, this church was created, and it was created from those three jurisdictions that we just noted that 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 appeared after the collapse of communism. Um, it, it included the autocephalous Orthodox Church that that was now 
kind of blessed to exist. It included the um, uh, Philoret's autocephalous church. Philoret was not given a place of uh, authority in this church against his expectations, um, and he was very bitter about that. But his churches that he ruled over were now drawn into this canon- this, this church that the Patriarch of Constantinople claims is canonical. And even a small number of Moscow Patriarchate churches in Ukraine also join. Now, the, the numbers here are significant but hard to establish. Moscow seems to have about 12,000 parishes in Ukraine, and about less than 1,000 of those have joined um, the new autocephalous church um, created by the ecumenical patriarch. So the great majority of, 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 of Ukrainians who are under Moscow remain under Moscow. That's a big issue today for, for obvious reasons. So, yes, that's the origin then, Austin, of how we now today have two rival, you might call them, Orthodox churches in Ukraine. One claiming it's autocephaly with the blessing um, of the ecumenical patriarch, and the other um, continuing to identify with the larger Moscow patriarchate. Those two churches have leaders. They are called metropolitans. The leader of the Moscow Patriarchate Church in Ukraine is called Anufri. That's his name, Metropolitan Anufri. And the uh, leader of the uh, Autocephalus Church uh, is now, is, 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 he, his name is Epiphany, and he is the head of the, um, of the Ukrainian uh, Autocephalus Church created by Constantinople. And I hope that answers your question, gives you a sense of how that came about. Yeah, and I, I think it adds some texture and layer and complication to, to what's going on there today, which Lots of complications. yeah, the, it seems there is no shortage of that. I'm curious, and this isn't on the outline, and if there hasn't been any set, things said or you're not aware of it, feel free to just say so. But as I think about that, so a big thing in the news, and you mentioned that there was a statement today that I seem to have missed from Patriarch Kirill, though, it is kind of that seems to, well, it's not big, but at least in the religious world, people are interested in, in his role. Has there been anything said by Metropolitan Anufri? Ha, has he taken a stance on what's going on in, in this conflict? I think that's one of the most interesting questions, Austin, of what's going on and how are Orthodox leaders responding to the crisis, the invasion, the upheavals that are occurring. Um, Metropolitan Onufri, who is the Metropolitan of Kiev, and affiliated with the Moscow Patriarchate, um, has made very, very clear and strong statements about this, especially since the invasion started uh, on February 24th. And those statements are to the effect that we are Ukrainian Orthodox Christians, we stand with Ukraine, for Ukraine, and we call for an immediate end to this war, a withdrawal of Russian troops, and uh, and, and very much focusing on Putin as really Ukraine's enemy. That's that's from the metropolitan who affiliates with Kirill and the larger Moscow Patriarchate. So I guess to summarize that point, it's clear that in Ukraine, the Orthodox Church um, uh, that has this long histor- historical connection with Russia functions very much as a national church with her own sense of national identity, national pride, and, and national self-preservation and can think distinctly from Kirill and the, Mo- the Moscow Patriarchate within Russia. That's really interesting. And so there's that tension there. And then I, I haven't been paying a whole lot of attention to this personally, but there's also the Russian Orthodox Church in America, right? Rokor, is that, mm-hmm. do I have that right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Is there tension there? As, have, have they remained more or less neutral in this, or have they taken a side? Well, um, I, I, first of all, I want to emphasize, um, it is the historical, it's really the historical practice, the, the pastoral or archpastoral practice of Orthodox bishops and even heads of uh, primates of local um, autocephalous churches not to take sides, even though as human beings, they're sinners, and as human beings, they get involved in the culture and politics of their age, and inevitably they do take sides. And so there's plenty of examples of that throughout history, both in the East and the West. 
In the case of uh, Rokor, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, another detail of the history of the 20th century that just makes things even more complicated, when the Russian Revolution occurred and, and well, after that occurred, a large number of Russian emigres left Russia and settled in the West and other parts of the world, China and other places, Australia, and um, and they formed a another jurisdiction called, as you just said, Rokor, Russian Orthodox Church uh, outside of Russia. Uh, their headquarters today are in Jordanville, um, New York, upstate New York, um, and uh, and they um, that body um, rejoined the Moscow Patriarchate. Um, uh, not too long ago, after being separated from it because of the disruptions, political, ideological disruptions of communism. Once Soviet Union was gone, it was possible to reunite those two bodies. So one would expect from Rokor, you know, appreciation for and sympathy for the perspective of the Moscow Patriarchate. However, um, you mentioned the American uh, Rokor. Keep in mind, Rokor is international. It's not just an American or Canadian thing. And so uh, the, the Rokor bishops of Western Europe, and there is a very significant Russian Orthodox present in, presence in Western Europe, Rokor presence there, they issued, I think there was four bishops together issued a few days after the invasion, a statement calling for peace, immediate peace, and also stating that um, they will not stand in judgment over anyone, whether it be um, uh, political forces in Russia, political forces in Ukraine, but it is the calling of the bishops to call for peace, immediate peace, repentance uh, for violence and strife and hostility, especially when it comes to this tragedy of the Orthodox fighting Orthodox. Just a little insertion here. Um, the West, I think, you know, we were talking about this by email before we started. The West has plenty of, you mentioned this, plenty of history. I mean, the Hundred Years' War, for instance, between Roman Catholic England and Roman Catholic France, plenty of wars between members of the same church in the West. The East has some of that historically, Bulgaria and, and Byzantium, for instance, but not a lot because the East was largely ruled by multinational empires in which national, you know, conflict didn't really, you know, have a, didn't get off the ground very well. And so this current crisis and war is really terribly shocking and, and, uh, and disturbing to an Orthodox Christian because we don't have a whole lot of history of Orthodox states fighting, fighting wars against other states, predominantly Orthodox. And uh, the Rokor statement, back to your question about Rokor, was, I think, an expression of this. Stop the violence, bring peace. This needs to come to a, an immediate end through repentance. But we, the bishops, are not going to take sides. That's not the job or role of a bishop. The bishop is an arch pastor. That means he's concerned with care, pastoral care for everyone. And that's why it's important for every bishop to identify with his flock, whether it's of one political disposition or the opposite political disposition. Um, the, the importance of the church is not to take political sides and try to achieve some sort of political, certainly military ends. The role of the church is to transform the world, to transfigure the world, uh, to bring the kingdom of heaven into this world where there is no longer Greek or Jew or any differences between race, ethnicity, uh, or uh, or nationality um, within the life of the church uh, that divides it that is yeah I think there's there's a lot of fruitful avenues we could take that down I I can imagine and so I, I want to at least give you the opportunity to speak to this if, if you'd like um, I have a very diverse audience and um, many of them seem to enjoy arguing about things in comment sections, which hey, it drives up the algorithm and gets views. So I suppose, you know, maybe it's worth the headache. But something that will inevitably come up in this, and you're absolutely right, that there have been wars between Roman Catholics, there have been wars between Protestants, and I think we like to have a short historical memory with our own uh, shortcomings, and, and I think that's wrong. We, we should have a more holistic vision of this. Um, but I can anticipate, and I've already seen people making comments about the, the issues of um, an orthodoxy of this kind of nationalist orthodoxy that, you know, um, that people have interpreted this as kind of a flowering of that. Now, I, I'm not sure that's fair in any means, but, but how, would, how would you respond to maybe parishioners or people who are worried that um, you know, for all of the, the wonderful aspects of kind of the conciliar uh, dynamic of orthodoxy, 
that, that this is exposing a, a weakness in having a Ukrainian church and a Russian church and a um, Belarusian and you know so on and so forth. Um, how how might people make sense of this in light of that? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, this is certainly. I mean, I I wrote a book called The Making of Holy Russia. Um, the Orthodox Church and Russian nationalism before the re revolution. So that was actually the major study I w undertook as a as a doctoral student is to understand that. And the book was a, a reworking of my dissertation on that topic. I think it's very interesting, very fascinating. In that book, The Making of Holy Russia, I, I start off by saying, by observing that Christianity is a universal faith. <laughs> There's no longer Greek or Jew. And, and so Christianity is 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 universal in its scope. It's not national. There's it's, it doesn't have a national it doesn't have national boundaries. The Orthodox Church in Russia before the revolution, actually, I bring this out in my in my book, had a strong sense of this. So there were ethnic nationalists in Russia before the revolution, and there are ethnic nationalists in Russia today after the collapse of communism. And these ethnic nationalists, you know, have slogans like "Russia for the Russians," "Kick everyone else out." There was a lot of anti-Semitism and, and, and mistreatment of Jews in, in the Russian Empire um, that, that preceded the revolution. Um, and Jews were, of course, on the receiving end of a lot of real strong hostility that sometimes assumed kind of quasi-religious forms. Now, I think, by the way, uh, for what it's worth, uh, modern anti-Semitism is not religiously motivated. It's not a Christian phenomenon. The Nazis are the great example. They were anti-Christian in almost everything they did and said. Um, and so the Holocaust was not a function of Christianity at all. I would strongly argue this, but but in another context. But back to your question about nationalism within the life of the Orthodox Church. In Russia, um, nationalism has played a role, and the, and the church leadership was trying to appropriate its strength to create a strong sense of identity by, so by, by placing that identity within the context of a larger Orthodox, international, universal identity so that there was a real strong emphasis on that. Uh, however, the fact remains, Austin, as you observed, that when you create autocephalous churches, um, if those churches assume a national form as they really have in modern times, then those churches can start to be bearers of, get, get mixed up with nationalist aspirations and goals that are not Christian, that can be even anti-Christian in some forms. And that is a very important question to keep like kind of you know in sight in, in what's going on right now historically this jurisdictionalism though the conciliar approach that was not based on na nation states i mean byzantium was n anything but a nation state it was a multinational empire in which the greek language prevailed but there were syrians and palestinians egyptians there were north africans there were Slavs, there were Latins, there were, you know, there were Celts, <laughs> uh, Anglo-Saxons in the in the in that empire. I mean, at least early on, um, and and they were certainly in the Orthodox Church, and 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 so that was not a nation national, that was not a, a form that was not a national form in this conciliarity. I think what you're bringing attention to is the fact that the political reality today in a post-communist world is. Uh, na nationalism. That's what's left. And that's why that, I think that's what the patriarchate of, 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 of Moscow is trying to address. Kirill is trying to address this as someone whose scope and pastoral responsibilities is not just national, it's international in the sense that not only Russians and Belarusians, but also Ukrainians um, and many others as well belong to his flock. Has he done a good job of this? Frankly, I think one could say that um, there's 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 questions to be raised about how well he's handled that question, but it's a complicated question that we might want to get into. I don't know if if you you'd like to go in that direction. Yeah, so I think that gets to a important question that a lot of people are asking, and that surrounds the role of Patriarch Kirill, and specifically trying to get inside of his mind, which as a historian um, is always a tricky thing to do and we can only do with very low levels of uh, any type of certainty, but we, we can maybe venture guesses as to what is going on. Uh, you mentioned that he has this concept of kind of like a multinational Orthodox Church over which um, he is responsible. 
What do you see him trying to do in the midst of this conflict? I mean, on the one side, there seems to be this very close relationship with Putin and maybe in what you described as kind of that symphony. I'm not sure I'll let you talk about that. Uh, but mm-hmm. what what is his role in this and what is what do you think he's he's trying to accomplish in the midst of this? That's a great question. And I, I think, again, um, history will show because it's very hard to know. Um you know, first of all, Kirill himself came to power, was ordained and, and got, you know, kind of raised within the structure of administrating, ministering the uh, Moscow Patriarchate in late Soviet times. So, you know, that's part of the picture. Uh, the Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate was not in its healthiest condition, obviously, when you had a very powerful anti-Christian state, the Soviet bureaucracy, working against it and allowing it, tolerating it, its existence, but only on certain conditions that, you know, would not seem to threaten the ideology of communism. So once that's all gone, um, the 1990s saw the liberation of the Moscow Patriarchate from that. But the personnel leading the Patriarchate, like the personnel leading the Soviet, I'm not, sorry, the post-Soviet Russian Federation, later Putin himself, before him Yeltsin, you know, all kind of brought with them a life experience, you know, that can't be separated from these from these uh, from these forces. What does Kirill want? What is he? How does he see the picture? I think um, we can just take it at, at um, face value, his statements that he's made so far. First of all, um, he uh, has not emerged from this with the same level of um, urgency to uh, to call for peace um, to uh, to identify Putin as as really uh, someone who has caused the problem uh, uh, to to in, in ordering the invasion and things like that. Um, he seems neutral um, to the point of for some people anyway, um, uh, favoring the Russian side in this conflict. However, on the face of it, he has not taken sides. He has not said Putin was right. It's very important. He has not said Russia's in the right here. He's not said anything of the sort. So I think a lot of people in the West, especially who don't appreciate or maybe even positively don't like um, the role of Orthodox Christianity, traditional Christianity in in modern civilization, have been quick to bring attention to perceived shortcomings of Kirill's leadership in this. What does he want? I think what he wants is he wants peace, first of all. Like, I think all the bishops want peace. This is, this is, this is pleasing to absolutely no one. It's, it's an abomination, especially ter- taking place before and during the opening of the Great Fast, when uh, Orthodox Christians are called upon to repent, like all Christians are. And, uh, and in the Orthodox liturgical tradition, um, we begin Great Lent uh, after a day called uh, the Sunday of Forgiveness, Forgiveness Sunday, where we ask, for forgiveness and grant forgiveness. So how can you know a conflict like this be breaking out right on the eve of that? Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of um, priests and deacons of the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate under Kirill have, um, have written um, a petition um, calling on Putin to, to lay down arms and to bring an end to this war and, and saying it's unjust. So they've been very, very st- strong in their statement. Um, there's like over 300 um, priests and deacons who have signed this statement. Um, but, but Kirill himself has not come out with such strength. And I think that's because he is overseeing a multinational church. Um, it's not a national church, even though it kind of looks like that. It's really a multinational church that he's the arch pastor of and responsible to. But I also think more deeply, uh, Austin, and this is a, a really interesting, important question, I think more deeply, he really does appreciate um, the point of view, or holds the point of view, that Russia and uh, and her or and and the Orthodox Christian civilization that historically has been, you know, really behind Russia's civilization, despite efforts by the secular state, beginning with Peter and even more so under the communists and under Putin too, to reduce its power really sees a uh, growing problem in, in, in Western civilization. But there's a real sense among the Orthodox in Russia. There are exceptions, but there's a real sense of this. And for Orthodox in Ukraine, too, that secularization is creeping in, and not even really creeping in, but bursting in to Eastern Europe 
after the collapse of communism, and that the West, um, either in a geopolitical sense, with the expansion of NATO up to the borders of the of, of Russia, uh, including former Soviet and former former Soviet aligned states, geopolitically and also culturally, uh, by advancing you know a lot of causes, a lot of um, uh, a lot of cultural causes, um, same sex marriage being you know the most hot and button issue probably that's out there today, but a lot of other stuff as well, um, is trying to um, subvert the very nascent, very tentative restoration of a traditional Christian culture in Russia after the collapse of communism. The 90s were a disaster for most Russians. Um, economically, uh, things just fell to pieces. Um, politically, Yeltsin was a very poor ruler. Um, but the church did have a chance to recover a large part of the Russian population under Kirill, who comes to power, I think 2009 is when Kirill is, becomes patriarch. Um, and, and in Russia, there's been a tentative restoration uh, in society of a, of a traditional Christian sense of things. This has been supported by the state under Putin, who's made a, an alliance with this perspective. Uh, it fits well with his nationalist kind of perspective on Russia. And, um, and I think Kirill himself and people affiliated or aligned with Kirill's thinking see the West as just pushing and pushing and pushing ideologically with its cultural agenda and also uh, geopolitically with its alliance agenda with NATO, pushing against Russia. And Ukraine becomes kind of the proxy for this. And that Ukraine, which has a lot of people who sympathize and identify with the Moscow Patriarchate, as I mentioned earlier, 12,000 parishes in, in Ukraine today. Uh, Ukraine is a battleground between these two civilizational forces, the West with its kind of liberal democracy, postmodern, whatever kind of, you know, however you want to define its culture, um, and, and Russia trying to find a, an, an alternative path into the future that's no longer communist, but also it's not liberal, liberal democratic in the way that the the United States has 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 been able to pioneer that form of civilization during the Cold War. I think that is also on Kirill's mind here. He's an arch pastor for more than just Russians, but he's also concerned very much with trying to cultivate um, a traditional Christian um, civilization and culture in Russia. And Ukraine seems to be used as a proxy for forces from the West to try to bring Ukraine more integrated into the EU and its very secular approach to things to bring more pressure ultimately on Russia to, to, do, to go in the same direction. So I think that leads to a major question, which is admittedly difficult to answer like this last one. But so we have there like uh, a perspective on, on what you might think is driving Patriarch Kirill and his motivations. And you mentioned that Putin has kind of made an alliance with the Orthodox Church. Um, and I forget the exact word you may used there, but at least one narrative is that this is purely an alliance of convenience, right? That Putin has his agendas and aligning with the Orthodox Church helps, you know, him do that. And so insofar as it's helpful, that alliance stands. Do you see what Putin is doing, whether largely or specifically in Ukraine here, as motivated by those same religious concerns as, um, you know, Ukraine becoming, uh, coming under liberal secular ideology? Or do you think that's more of what Kirill might be thinking and less what Putin might be thinking? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think both of them are thinking that at some level. I, 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 you know, Putin is president of the Ruf Russian Federation, who's lived his life for acquiring that power. And since acquiring it in 2000, as the successor um, to Boris Yeltsin, uh, re retaining that power, even to the point of altering the political constitutional kind of dimension of presidential um, uh, 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 periods of, uh, uh, of, of rule and so forth. Um, so he's he's really concerned with holding on to power. Um, beyond that, probably he does have some convictions about this. He is an Orthodox Christian. He is seen to attend Orthodox services. 
He's known to have communication with Kirill and other leaders of the Orthodox Church. Um, so that's, I mean, that is a remarkable thing. Yeltsin was, you know, largely secular, the product of a, a, a late Soviet secular mindset. Putin, um, the product of the same mindset, has nevertheless adopted more kind of recognizable Orthodox um, points in his in his in his policies. Um, but I would not equate what he thinks and does with what Kirill thinks and does. I think there's very significant differences there, and it's it gets blurred, right? And once one uses a term like symphony, you know, like you know, and, tr- and that that idea is that they're really just one. I, there's so many. It's so easy. The, the news reporting of, of of Russia up until the invasion rarely said anything about Putin without mentioning that he was a member of the KGB at one point, and he was. I mean, it's striking. So was George Bush, the, our first George Bush. He was head of the uh, CIA, not the KGB, but the CIA. He was head of the CIA, but very few people, when they introduce you know, the administration of George Bush in the early 1990s, make a point of saying and he was once our chief spy, head of the CIA, because it's not an issue because he's just kind of given a pass. I mean, he's understood to be a, a you know, a, a legitimate ruler. Putin is always delegitimated in our media because he once was a member of the KGB, even though the same, the double standard is, is obvious there when it comes to someone like George Bush. Um, so it's really easy to simplify to the point of absurdity um, the complexity of what's going on in Putin's mind when we think about his policies that are pro-church, you might say. For instance, Putin has supported the exclusion of certain um, religious bodies from the West evangelizing in Russia. This goes back to the 1990s under Yeltsin. Um, there was a flood of evangelization from very well-funded Western, usually Protestant bodies into Russia after the collapse of communism. The Orthodox Church, you know, what had been you know, almost obliterated by communism, had no way of like, responding in kind to evangelize and found herself overwhelmed. And so the state stepped in and said, we're going to limit the um, evangelizing of, of foreign uh, religious bodies uh, to those who have been here for a long time, have an historical presence. So you might see that as being pro-church, pro-Orthodox church. Putin has also um, um, inter- supported restrictions on Uh, the dissemination of literature that promotes or supports or uh, pays sympathy to same-sex marriage, things like that, allowing same-sex couples to adopt children, things like that, which many people would see as being aligned with traditional Christian policy within the Orthodox Church. So it's really easy to say Putin is, is, is appealing to the Orthodox, and Kirill, for his part, you know, has said many complimentary things to Putin. He's not been a critic at all of Putin. In fact, just the opposite. He supported Putin. And so that relationship there is, is definitely obvious. But I don't think the, the relationship of such complex offices as Patriarch of Moscow and President of the Russian Federation, I don't think that that should, should change the fact that these are two different people with very different priorities and values. Yeah, I appreciate the nuance there, and it's helpful to always be also critical of the way that we're thinking about things. I think you're, the, the comment you made about George Bush and the CIA versus how we characterize Putin with the KGB it is one of those good self-reflective practices of seeing, okay, are we painting this in a way that we wouldn't paint ourselves? And you know, I think good historical research, good understanding of current events, and even just well, basic like Christian empathy requires being able to understand other viewpoints and be self-reflective in that way. So I, I do appreciate that. As we begin to land the plane, I want to maybe offer a couple of things. So one, I guess to summarize what we've talked about, what would you say are a few of the, the key ideas for people that want to be able to better understand this, specifically the religious and historical aspects of what's going on here. If they have like the Cliff Notes version of like, hey, I'm confused. Is this just one rogue madman invading a country and it happened out of nowhere and there's no explanation for it? Or is, you know, there's some key interpretive ideas that doesn't necessarily excuse this. And I, I don't want to make this a thing of like, and this means it's good. But how can we understand what's happening? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, that's a that's a that's a great, but it's also a big question, a complex question, Austin. I I, I think that my best effort at um, of of kind of bringing to a conclusion or discussion here around that that question would be, um, I think what we want to do is think about what what is what is the church at least understood by the Orthodox, especially the Orthodox living through this horrible um, series of events. What is the church and what is her what is her identity? What's her role? What's her mission? What's her ministry? in a broken, sinful world. Um, first of all, it is not the church's conviction historically that we can perfect this world. That's called utopia. I wrote, writing a four-volume four series of books talking about the differences between paradise, which is not of this world, which, which historically Christians were able to experience in, in Western civilization as having broken into this world through the incarnation, but is always beyond this world. This world will always be a broken, sinful place. And utopia, contrast with paradise, which is a conviction that we can really in, improve and in, in some ways, you know, delusionally even perfect this world. And I think what we want to do is remember, we will not, as Christians, be able to stop wars from happening. Uh, Christ, when he was in what was born, uh, was accompanied by peace on earth, goodwill toward man. Um, this is this is our hope for peace of the world. But we know that this is a peace from above, as we say in the divine liturgy of the Orthodox Church, for the peace from above, the peace from the kingdom of heaven, the peace that that really is not of this world. We know this world continues to be driven by very unpeaceful um, and, and very broken forces. I think that's obvious now what's going on in Ukraine. It's horrifying to see those images so common in the, you know, just everywhere in the Western media right now of bombed hospitals, apartment blocks, uh, old women lying dead on the side of the road, having been shot down, gunned down, and all this stuff is going on. Um, it's just horrible. But I think what we want to do is remember that as much as we must, as Christians, engage this world and bring the peace from above to this world, we know that we will not perfect this world. This world will remain broken. That utopia is a delusion, that utopia is a counterfeit of the kingdom of heaven, which is not of this world. And so as we Christians, Orthodox and, 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 and non-Orthodox Christians, think about and engage what we see happening right now, I think we need to just you know accept that, that our mission is to bring peace, to bring Jesus Christ to this world, to bring the incarnate Lord who brought peace from, from above into this world, and as the church, I'm speaking here about the Orthodox Church, we need to bring Christ and his peace to this world and, and, and pray a, a for an end to this, to this violence. Um, how, we, how we go about doing that is going to be different for different people with different points of view. But we know, I think what we have to accept is that there will be disturbances to the peace. There will be disruptions. There will be wars and, and rumors of wars, right? And that will continue until the end. And uh, I don't mean to suggest then that we could become, you know, somehow a uh, passive about this. Um, but I, uh, at the same time, I worry that the, the America has a very utopian kind of mentality that we're going to go out there, we're going to bring, we're going to bring, we're going to bring progress to the whole world around us. We're going to, you know, we're going to invade Afghanistan and build a thriving democracy, so uh, liberal democracy in Afghanistan. Women will have rights there and, and the Taliban will be, you know, a thing of the past. And of course that didn't happen. And I think I'm, I'm afraid, and here I am expressing some of my political views, so forgive me for this, but I am I am human. I'm an American. I think what we're doing in 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 in, in our policies in Eastern Europe sometimes has an element of that is that we Americans really can't tolerate seeing brokenness and we want to fix it. And that's a good thing. That's part of the genius of our civilization. We want to make it better. But sometimes I think we're we're kind of deluding ourselves into thinking that we can move in somewhere and, and make things better um, by expressing these strong judgments that really simplify um, the situation and condemn our apparent opponents. And I'm afraid that's kind of what's going on right now is it's becoming very simple and easy to condemn certain parties here and to celebrate other parties without really looking at the historical context in which this tragedy has, has, has occurred. In the end, I think we don't make judgments 
and we pray for peace and and bring Christ's love uh, to those around us. Well, I think that's just about as good a place as any to end there. You know, I, I was going to uh, ask about kind of the, the pastoral wisdom, and you, you fused that into that answer very well. And so, Father John, I really appreciate your time today. I appreciate you coming back on the channel. Always a uh, pr- pleasure to have people on for a second time. And, uh, yeah, I just encourage everyone watching um, to, to pray for peace, uh, as you talked about there. And so thank you all for your time, and uh, God bless.